God told the Israelites to build a temple, which they called the tabernacle. He told them precisely how which bit must be built, so that it would be as accurate as possible to the real temple in heaven. Today, Jesus is in the temple in heaven, but to understand what he's doing there, we first have to understand the temple that was on earth. The Israelites donated their gold and jewellery to build the temple. They were so keen to donate that they gave more than was needed and Moses had to tell them to stop. God didn't force them to give things to build the temple because for people to follow God, they have to want to follow him, so it's worthless to force people. The fact that despite difficult circumstances, the Israelites were so generous shows that they valued God's presence and blessing higher than worldly goods. And this shows us how we should be despite the difficult circumstances we often have. The times when the Israelites repeatedly complained and made mistakes is a warning of how we shouldn't be, especially as we are so close to the end of the world and difficulties for us Christians will greatly increase. Moses had to put the two stones that had the Ten Commandments inside an ark. The ark was covered with gold and on the top was the mercy seat. Each end was a statue of an angel. The heads looked down at the mercy seat, which represents the fact that the angels look with interest and respect at the law of God inside the ark, in the temple that is in heaven. And the tabernacle had two apartments, separated by a curtain. The curtain was a variety of colours, with threads of gold and silver. This represents the angels, who are connected with the work of the temple in heaven, by helping and teaching Christians on earth. On the other side of the curtain was the Ark of the Testimony. Directly in front of the Ark, but separated by the curtain, was the golden altar of incense. The incense filled the temple with its fragrance, day and night. The fragrance extended for miles around. This represents the prayers we make, because to God, our prayers are like sweet incense. When the priest offered the incense to God, he looked to the mercy seat, where God's presence was. The curtain meant that although the priest looked towards the mercy seat, he couldn't see God, but he had faith that the mercy seat was on the other side of the curtain. This represents people praying to Jesus, voiced by the mercy seat in heaven. We cannot see Jesus, but we have faith that he is there, listening and answering our prayers. The temple had no windows, but light came from the candlestick, which kept burning 24 hours a day. The high priest could only go into the most holy place, on the other side of the curtain, once a year. This was of the careful preparation, because it was the special place where you could see God's glory. The high priest was always nervous when he went in. The Israelites would wait outside, desperate to hear the priest say that God blessed the people. If the priest took a long time, they would be worried that their sins were so bad that God had killed the priest. After the temple was built, God's glory filled it and a cloud covered it in the daytime and the fire covered it at the night time. It was built so that it could be taken apart and taken with them on their travels. God led the Israelites with the cloud. When he wanted them to stop and stay somewhere, he made the cloud drop and rest directly over the temple. God would lift the cloud up high to signal that he wanted them to start moving again. The tribes had to travel in order and had to put their tents just as God wanted them to arrange them around the temple. When they travelled, the ark was always at the front. The Israelites asked God to protect them from their enemies, so God would go out and do this during the day and return and be with them when they were camped. Aaron and his two elder sons, Nadab and Abihu, were priests. Their job included offering sacrifices to God on the altar in the tabernacle. God showed that he accepted the sacrifices by making the offerings to catch fire. Priests were supposed to burn incense using the fire that God put on the altar. However, Aaron's sons made their own fire to burn the incense. Because of this, God sent down fire and killed Nadab and Abihu. After Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abayu were the most important Israelites. We should all remember that no one can get away with sinning without punishment because of who they are, how close to God they have been, or how much good they have done. God brings you closer to him so that you can work harder for him, not so that you can feel safe to sin. 
Aaron hadn't been strict enough with Nadab and Abihu when they were kids. He should have made sure that they knew not to do things that seemed fun if it went against God. We often think that giving kids freedom is the right thing to do, but we see that with Nadab and Abihu, even working in such important jobs as adults wasn't enough to correct their lack of self-discipline from childhood, to follow exactly and not roughly as God requires us to follow him, and this led to their deaths. God requires us to respect him and understand the seriousness of needing to follow him in the way that he tells us to follow him. God doesn't accept it when we partially obey him. Nadab and Abihu did everything close to how God asked for. God tells us that we have to follow all of the Ten Commandments in the way that he tells us to. If we fail, he will forgive us, but Nadab and Abihu didn't try to follow God in the right way. They knew God had told them to use the fire from the altar, but they thought that God wouldn't mind if they made their own fire. When we look at the Ten Commandments, are we following them in the way that God tells us to follow them? Or are we changing them to be the commandments that we want to follow? If we are choosing to change them and assume God doesn't mind, then we could be heading for the fire at the end of the world. Aaron wasn't allowed to show sadness for his son's deaths, because otherwise people would sympathise with Nadam and Abayu, and then they would forget how serious their sin was. Then they wouldn't see sins as being that important, and they would be more likely to copy them. We must warn people how serious their sins are, so they know that they need to change. Today we have forgotten how serious sin is, like Nadab and Abihu, and we think that the Ten Commandments don't need to be kept in the exact way they state. We think that because God forgives us when we try but fail to keep the commandments, he's not strict and doesn't mind if we keep a relaxed or changed version of the commandments. If we choose to follow a relaxed or changed version of the commandments and still expect God to forgive us, then he can't. We are forgiven when we choose but fail to follow God's law, not when we choose to follow a different law. If we knowingly choose to follow a relaxed or different law, then we are breaking God's commandments but are not sorry for it. If we are not sorry for breaking them, then God can't forgive us. If we were really sorry for not following him, then we would make the decision to follow his laws and not put ourselves above them. Because God refuses to force us to follow him, and we are refusing to listen to the Holy Spirit to change, there is nothing more that God can do for us. We won't get forgiveness, so we will have to get the punishment for the sin, which is eternal death. A lot of people will not go to heaven because they assume God is relaxed about how his laws are kept and whether we can keep a slightly different version. Whether this is the Sabbath or any of the commandments, this may make us end up in fire like Nadab and Abayu, but this will be the internal fire of hell.